Did the United States' unilateral withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal have the sort of domestic as well as external political impact that Donald Trump, when he was leader of the free world, envisaged? Five months after the right-wing elite in Peru ousted the democratically elected leader Pedro Castillo, are those in power willing to hear the voice of the people? And Hollywood's writers are on strike, rightfully demanding that they see some of the benefits of the massive profits being made by big studios. But why are the suits in charge in no mood to share? Salams, as always, you're watching The Daily Debrief. We will attempt to answer all of these questions on the show today. So let's get straight into it. On a day like yesterday, five years ago, the Donald Trump administration decided to unilaterally withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, this deal, of course, was instrumental in ensuring that Iran is allowed to have a peaceful nuclear program while also controlling weaponization. Uh, unfortunately, that deal no longer exists. Five years on, we talked to News Click Editor-in-Chief Prabir Purkayasa about whether uh, the U.S.'s withdrawal, of course, unilateral, has had the kind of impact that its leadership expected then, both in terms of domestic politics as well as international ramifications. Uh, Prabir, welcome back to the Daily Debrief Studios. Uh, like I was saying in the intro, five years have passed since the U.S. unilaterally withdrew from uh, the Iran nuclear deal. It's had all kinds of impacts, uh, but most significantly, as the dynamics in the region change, um, perhaps as Trump construed it five years ago, it hasn't quite worked out from an American perspective from that angle. Withdrawing from the nuclear, nuclear deal. deal. Yeah. Yes, U.S. unilateral of withdrawal from the nuclear deal has backfired on the United States. One part of it is the sheer fact that today Iran has uh, started the centrifuges again. They were under no bar to do so after Trump withdrew from the deal and yeah. the deal was effectively dead mm. because the condition for the deal was that Iran's financial sanctions, other sanctions would be withdrawn. Mm. Once that didn't happen, those sanctions actually went back mm. because the West also said, okay, you've started again uh, centrifuging, centrifuges, etc., etc. So the sanctions were not uh, withdrawn. So effectively, Iran therefore had no bar of uh, purifying uranium to the level that they wanted. And let's face it, they have reached a level of uh, purification the, of uh, fissile material yeah. from which, through the centrifuges, they are just a little few steps away mm. from getting it to the nuclear weapons grade, grade, weapons grade. Mm. Already, in fact, it can be construed to be weapons grade. Mm. So, well, just a couple of more uh, Steps, steps yeah. it happens. That's also because the nature of the centrifuging process is such that the first concentration up to 20% really requires most of the effort mm. and the most of the energy. Mm. After that, successively, it becomes much easier. Mm. That's the nature of the uh, physical process right. itself. So what they have done is they have allowed Therefore, Iran, mm. to do what would be called a breakout, mm. that they, if they want to make the bomb, they can do so, yeah. and they can do so relatively quickly. quickly. That is one. Second, it has forced Iran to be self-sufficient in a whole number of different ways. It has spurred the domestic industry, therefore, to meet a lot of the uh, supplies that they need. Mm. And also the relation, trade <coughs> relationship with other countries. Today, Russia being under sanctions, therefore, Earlier, it's also Russia had actually not put Iran under sanctions. Yeah. China had trade relations with Iran. Mm. So with this kind of scenario emerging, mm. these things have become much more natural for the countries like Russia and China to work more closely with Iran. Mm. So given that, the Iran's breakout from sanctions has happened, mm. breakout from the purification uh, embargo that they had themselves accepted has mm. happened. Mm. So I think that at the moment, Iran has very little to gain uh, further by complying with the demands that are being made on them, going back to, uh, again, to what Trump withdrew from. Yeah. And Trump's, uh, uh, what Trump did 
in Iran mm. has completely backfired on the United States. Mm. We, we will, of course, uh, separately at another time look at the domestic political uh, ramifications of, of this entire process. Uh, but essentially what the 12-point agenda that Trump laid out uh, meant was a complete political capitulation on the part of Iran. Uh, and and I, I suppose that is also similar to the United States' is agenda with anyone it considers to be any kind of opposition uh, to its, uh, well, whether ideologically or, or milit militarily or otherwise. Uh, in all of that context, Prabir, how do you look at conversations about Iran joining the SCO, uh, Syria getting back into the Arab League, uh, and all of these other dynamics that have kind of changed and accelerated after the breakout of the war in Ukraine? You know, it's interesting that you raise the issue of uh, what Trump thought would happen once he broke the Iran agreement, mm. thinking that Iran would capitulate, as you said, and proving therefore domestic to his domestic audience that Obama had reached a very bad deal. Yeah. A much deal was a much better deal was available. Yeah. You see, if you see the what has happened unfolded in the region after that, as you said. Syria has been uh, has been has come back into the Arab fold, mm. and uh, also that Iran has now is now developed relations with Saudi Arabia. Mm. So there is a regional correlation of forces which is taking place, very different mm. to what Trump had thought he would achieve through the Abraham Accords, mm. in which he had managed to get some of the Arab states, countries like Sudan, Morocco, also into the fold, mm. and try to build up uh, in Israel, Islamic countries in his books, Arab countries in his books, a re relationship, which if Saudi Arabia had joined the Abraham yeah. Accords, might have led to a very different correlation for forces. Mm. That did not happen. And historically, that seems to be now dead. dead. Yeah. So if that is so, then what would really make sense is for the regional parties to try and sort out the differences between themselves. Yeah. And Syria's readmission to the Arab brotherhood, mm. shall we say, mm. over the steps that is taken, mm. is also very, it's very, very important because let's not forget, mm. a section of the Arab countries were behind the Islamist forces, which had uh, led to the civil war in uh, Syria. Mm. And the fact that they are now Readmitting Syria means that their support to the Islamic forces, now Islamist forces, yeah. I, I would not really call them Islamic forces. Yeah. They are really those which would be uh, outliers completely in Islamic society yeah. as well. Extreme so things. extreme uh, right-wing forces, mm. which the United States had also backed. Mm. So all that with the uh, some of the Gulf monarchies backing them, Saudis backing them, they had a great amount of disruptive power in Syria, Absolutely. which now has al has almost folded up. Mm. But you know, the problem is spoiler in the region still is in the United States mm. because they hold 30% of uh, Syria's uh, re uh, ground yeah. uh, area, mm. and that is their oil resources. Mm. Of course, they hold it in the name of the Kurds, but mm. really it's the Americans who are there. Mm. So all this realignment that is taking place, I think you'll see weakening of uh, United States influence in the region and Israel being more and more isolated in the region, which is what seems to be happening. And lastly, if we can, a quick word on uh, the US's other allies uh, who entered into this deal uh, alongside them and who have the European Union, for example, their diplomatic uh, chief uh, was right till the end hopeful that the deal can be renegotiated, re-entered into, uh, because it does have an impact on global energy security as well in terms of how these uh, countries can operate. Uh, in, in, in that sense, uh, have they been left, left in the lurch by the leader of the gang, as it were? By the United States. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Let's face facts. The United States has left them in the lurch a number of times. But unfortunately, given the correlation of forces globally, mm. they don't seem to have any autonomy okay. left now. So the days of, uh, you know, the Gaul mm. is long over. <laughs> and you don't see that even the kind of social democratic uh, power, political power that Willy Brandt had yeah. and the kind of uh, position that Germany could take, even mm. that doesn't seem to be at the moment on, on, in the picture. Mm. So you have a European Union 
very much toothless against their senior partner, the United States. Mm. Even when they disagree with them, they don't seem to have any leverage mm. over the policies. Yeah. And we can think about the, the Iran deal, the uh, Trump's withdrawal from it, and Biden's inability to reinst reinstate the Obama deal as something which is being held hostage by the domestic politics, yeah. that the United States domestic politics de decides this foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess any country's foreign policy is also a reflection of the domestic politics. In the case of European Union, what, or more correctly, Germany and France, mm -hmm. which are the two big countries, what is their importance, what is their internal politics, what is their external politics, at the moment is not clear to any of us. Mm. Because I, what we see is confused politics, yeah. whether it was the issue of Iran or whether it's the issue of Ukraine, from Minsk's accords to, you know, backing Ukraine, yeah, whole hint whole saying we were really buying time for Ukraine. <laughs> so whether they have an independent politics, to can they assert it, that's a question still to be uh, determined. determined. And it will, I guess, depend in large part on what the European people of these countries, the European countries, what do they feel are the urgent issues. Mm. If they are uh, completely, shall we say, held hostage by their media, mm. which has a very different view of the world yeah. than what rest of the world seems to yeah. feel, yeah. then I think we have the European uh, countries are going to become really, uh, what shall we say, uh, camp followers, street. camp followers of the United States, mm. and it doesn't augur well for them. Mm. And we've seen, in fact, people come out and say what is important to them across Europe, uh, whether it's the healthcare workers striking in the United Kingdom, uh, protests against the pension reforms in France, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and of course the inflation situation that is uh, all across the continent. So clearly, there are issues that are domestically important to the people. But yeah, like you pointed out, uh, governments and the media seem to have, be on a different track. Thanks very much, Prabir, for joining us as always. It's been five months since Pedro Castillo was dramatically uh, removed in what has been called an in institutional coup uh, against his legally, democratically elected uh, government. He has been in detention ever since. There have been mass protests in the country uh, which were responded to uh, with massive oppression uh, by state security forces, including massacres in several parts of the country, uh, particularly of Peru's indigenous peoples. Uh, Zoe Alexandra has been covering, of course, uh, covers Latin America for People's Dispatch and has been reporting from Peru uh, during this period as well as before it and uh, joins us now via video conference for updates on the situation. Zoe, first up, bring us up to speed, please, on what's been happening over this period. Yes, well, it has been exactly uh, just over five months since Pedro Castillo was overthrown in a coup d'etat, uh, and Dina Boluarte was sworn in as a de facto president. And since then, Peru has been undergoing a very, very deep institutional, political, and social crisis, um, largely due to the massive protests that took place uh, against the coup. And so this happened again on December 7th, 2022. And immediately after uh, Pedro Castillo was, uh, you know, taken out of power, arrested, and sent to prison, um, people began to flood the streets uh, in rejection of what they saw as the undermining of their political vote and undermining of the political sovereignty of the political system, and really just uh, in a rejection to all of the moves by the right-wing elites in the country to prevent really the voice of the people from being in power. And since then, there were uh, weeks and weeks, months of protests against um, this coup regime, against all of the actions that it was taking, and these massive protests in all parts of the country were met with heavy, heavy, heavy repression. Um, the, uh, the military was deployed in several cities, especially in the rural areas in the south, uh, where communities of peasants, of people who are engaged in mining activities, of um, different sectors of rural society, a lot of teachers engaged as well, youth, um, we're on the highways, we're on the roads, we're on in the plazas, and many of them also actually went to the airports and blocked the airports to intensify their protests. And in several instances, and specifically in the example of Ayacucho, um, their protest at the airport was met again with extremely violent repression, um, live bullets fired on protesters, 
Um, several massacres occurred during this time period, during this mass mobilization, massacres which have been meticulously documented by uh, independent media, by international human rights organizations. Um, there's an estimated at least 60 people were killed in this period since December 7th till today. 60 protesters, uh, people who just went to the streets trying to participate, trying to uh, raise their voices against what happened and uh, were met with this face. So um, again, since December 7th, there was this mass, mass, mass uprising. In the last couple of months, maybe uh, six weeks in in April and you know some of March, these, these protests have really quieted down. Uh, the tactic of kind of just forcing people to withstand all of this repression and having to go onto the streets day after day after day and really giving no signs of any victories, of course, worn people out. And so there is kind of a dip in the protest now. Um, there were also efforts made in the legislative body to advance some of the demands that were raised by the protests on the street, which are very diverse and demand the uh, dissolution of the Congress, uh, the immediate renunciation of Dina Boluarte, uh, the drafting of a new constitution, amongst other demands. And these were also brought into, brought into the legislative body, as I mentioned. Um, but again, a lot of these uh, were not successful. So that's essentially what's been happening in these five months since uh, Pedro Castillo was overthrown. A very difficult situation for the people of Peru. Right now, there have been legitimate challenges to Dina Boluarte's continuity. Uh, how is the demand for change playing out after uh, what we were mentioning, the brutal repression of uh, po popular protests that emerged after Castillo was ousted? So as I said, one of the key demands of protesters on the streets was that Dina Boluarte resign. Uh, they say that um, she's not constitutionally legal as she took office following an illegal coup. Um, and furthermore, many people allege that she completely has betrayed, of course, the ticket that she was elected on. She was elected to serve with Pedro Castillo. And of course, she has completely uh, turned against him and um, and the progressive values that they ran on. So many say that her uh, position and that her role as president is completely legitimate. Um, and this, again, has been a demand raised on the streets, but also, as I mentioned before, it has been raised in, in the parliament. And so there were many attempts by the block of progressive legislators uh, to try to push forward the elections. Again, the elections uh, in Peru will be held normally in 2026. And so during this first month of the institutional crisis, um, there are many, many attempts to try to get elections held in 2024. Progressives were demanding that be, they be held in 2023. And now, as of now, uh, neither of these two options have actually been successful. And so recently, Dene Boluarte was quoted saying that uh, the elections will happen in 2026, as it should be according to the Constitution. So while this does remain a principal demand of people on the streets and has only increased in relevance, especially given... Um, the brutal repression that has been unleashed against protesters during uh, her time in office. Um, you know, essentially she is now de facto in power and doesn't look like she's gonna be leaving anytime soon. She has support, of course, not of progressives, but of major center and right-wing parties. Uh, They're completely happy with her being in office as she's sort of uh, implementing their their desires and has not gone against the right wing since being sworn in. So as of now, uh, despite the very very strong battle that was waged on the street calling for her to be to resign, the battle in parliament. It seems that as of now, uh, elections will likely be held only uh, in 2026. Thanks very much for that, Zoe. Uh, and finally, Natalia Marquez, our North America correspondent, has been looking at the Writers Guild of America, which is on strike. Uh, it's been on strike for a while now, uh, demanding that the wages and work conditions of the writers who write big television shows, big studio productions, uh, movies as well, uh, share some of the massive pro uh, profits that 
these big studios have made over the course of the past few years, particularly with the introduction of new technology. Uh, they're talking about re uh, regulation of, or at least uh, proper use of artificial intelligence when it comes to the writing of shows uh, and other kinds of uh, media, television uh, productions. Uh, and of course, demanding a, a greater share in the profits that rightly they contribute massively to. Uh, Natalia has been covering the protest, uh, has also uh, written for People's Dispatch on the subject, and joins us now via video conference. Uh, Natalia, the impoverished writer is, is a trope that Hollywood seems to have internalized in this case. Uh, where does the strike stand as of now? So right now, um, over 11,000 TV and film writers um, have completed over a week of striking. Um, on May 1st, the Writers Guild of America announced that they would strike um, because writers and studios were unable to reach an agreement on key proposals. Um, but the central reason um, and the larger context of the issue is really that um, you know, studios, big studios like Netflix, um, like NBC Universal, have made enormous profits um, over the past years from streaming. Um, but writers have really yet to see any of those profits go to their wages and be um, properly compensated for the work that they do. Um, so the Writers Guild of America, which is organizing these 11,500 writers, um, writes that in 2000, the a combined entertainment profits of Disney, Fox, Paramount, NBC, Universal, and Time Warner amounted to approximately $5 billion. But um, just 19 years later, um, um, adding in Netflix, the profits of big studios were um, uh, about 30 billion out of more than 50 billion in total company profits. Um, and um, entertainment profits were estimated to be more than 20 billion in 2021. So essentially, the profits of large studios have skyrocketed. But writers um, want to see that reflected in their wages and the compensation that they get. Um, but you know, so far, that has not happened. Um, so writers in the Writers Guild of America are demanding um, more job security, um, you know, protections and regulations of the artificial intelligence technology that some studios are starting to use, um, and higher wages. Of course, big Hollywood studios are in no mood uh, to share any of those profits that uh, you know they are raking in, the growth in revenue, uh, perhaps they are not attributing it enough to the writers or whatever the other reasons are. Uh, negotiations between the two sides have broken down. Uh, Natalia, what, what, what is sort of the reasoning that studios have given for this breakdown in talks and for being unwilling to listen to what the writers are asking for? So, you know, according to the studios, um, the writers simply have too many demands, right? They're referencing this magnitude of proposals, um, essentially saying that they cannot afford to give writers um, the demands that they need. Um, but writers have pointed out some of the hypocrisy in this argument because, you know, um, they're spending $19 billion a year on making new shows, they're buying other companies, they're leveraging debt, um, you know, they're making a lot of money. And so these demands, which the writers have um, calculated will add up to about 429 million per year, um, which is nowhere near the sort of profits that these studios are making. Um, writers are arguing that that's a reasonable demand, um, but the studio um, only you know rejected many proposals, um, including you know minimum staff guarantees, you know requiring studios to employ like a minimum amount of um, writers on any show and really lowballed the writers on things like demands for minimum pay increases. Um, and so the WGA has calculated that the studio's counter offers um, will only amount to 86 million per year, uh, a far cry from the 429 million that writers are demanding. Um, but they, you know, um, there's a lot of solidarity on the picket line. Actors are, are picketing in solidarity, Teamsters are picketing in solidarity, um, other unions, so essentially from every level of production, workers are in solidarity with the writers in the entertainment industry. Um, celebrities have come out in support. Um, so 
essentially, um, that's where the strike is now. Um, and we'll have to wait and see where it goes. Right, that's a wrap on uh, this episode of The Daily Debrief. You have, of course, been watching People's Dispatch. Uh, as always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and the rest of the work we do. Don't also forget to follow us on social media uh, platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, etc. Uh, follow us for updates as well as to get in touch with us for your feedback and comments on the work we do. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, thank you for watching. Goodbye.